I don't think anybody needs to be told that we're in the American West. We happen to be high up in a windy mountain valley, 8,500 feet up in the Sierra Nevada, among the ghostly remains of an old mining town that struck it rich in 1876. We could be in any number of places between the Rockies and the Pacific, because the West is not only a place, it's a state of mind, the idea of El Dorado, of getting away from it all, of leading the new life under the big sky. Ninety years ago, this place was roaring with life and death. One killing a day, 56 saloons and gambling joints, 12,000 people here, all brimming with sap and mischief and vice. And today, it's as forgotten and forlorn as the plains of Troy. People often ask, where did the West begin? Well, it all depends which century you're talking in. 200 years ago, the West began 2,500 miles back east, wherever the first pioneers were moving along the ridges of the Appalachians. This was the first frontier. On Jordan's stormy bank I stand and cast a wishful eye to Cana's fair and lovely land where my possessions lie. The promised land. I'm bound for the promised land. Oh, who will come and go with me? I am bound for the promised land. These mountains and gorges, only half an hour's flight from Washington, D.C., were unfamiliar to the white man only two centuries ago. This was Indian country, which is why the pathfinders didn't advertise their routes why it was in caves that they made their base camps. Believe it or not, this is one. No modern conveniences. Uh, this was discovered only a dozen years ago, and there is strong proof that it was built as a hut inside this huge rock shelter by D. Boone, Daniel Boone, the most celebrated of the early surveyors and pathfinders. You might say, in fact, that he was the first Westerner, resting in some such place as this and then going out by day into the mountains and living the essentially stealthy and self-sufficient life. Hunting, trapping, surveying, killing, camping, resting again and then moving on on tiptoe. He disappeared for as long as two years at a stretch and some men, whole companies, disappeared altogether. No wonder the, uh, the phrase gone west very early on became a synonym for death, a meaning that it retained in Europe throughout the First World War. I don't think I could uh, stay in here for two nights. And I think possibly the most remarkable thing about this remarkable man was that he survived into his 90th year. In 1750, an English doctor found a gap through this mountain range and named it after the Duke of Cumberland. It became, and still is, the southern high road into the interior.
The early Pathfinder needed four essentials, health, an axe, a rifle, and salt. It cured your food. It was the preservative. Daniel Boone, by the way, must have had divining rods in his nostrils. It was said he could sniff salt at 30 miles. Now, you could get it from a creek, or better, from the standing water of a brine lake. The pioneers smelt it out here, which is appropriately in Boone County, Kentucky. But they were not the first. Two million years ago, you would have heard a noise through here like an earthquake. Dinosaurs, mastodons, sloths came galumphing in here, attracted by the salt. In the 1770s, uh, a Virginian named James Douglas came surveying through here, and he looked out on the whole valley as a graveyard of gigantic bones. Uh, teeth weighing 10 pounds each, thigh bones, five feet, 11 foot tusks. And in the evening, he camped, and they made tent poles of mastodon ribs. When they sat down to supper, they used vertebra as chairs. Now, the fame of all this spread all over. Expeditions came hustling in the Royal College of Surgeons in London, collared quite a pile, unfortunately destroyed in the Blitz. But today, there are some at the Museum of Natural History in Kensington. Here, in their natural place, they're very rare. This, by the way, is a tooth, I should hope, a molar, about as big as Yorick's skull. It was enough for the early pioneers over the turn of the 19th century that they could take a 1,000 gallons of the salt water from this vast brine lake that used to be here and boil it down to 20 pounds of salt. Now, this meant that there was no further compulsion to push on, and some of them simply settled in. It was in such clearings that the original frontiersmen first hunted for their food, planted crops, made a home. Mostly of English, Scotch, Irish stock with names like Jackson, Marshall, Lincoln, rude folk starting life like African tribes. Only a couple of hundred miles or more from the merchants of New York, from the elegance of Williamsburg. The people who had the get up and go to come through the mountains and make homes like these were the Democrats with a small d who would live out and transform the neat, noble system of government written by the lawyers and landowners in Philadelphia. Those who pushed farther inland came on a race of amphibious pioneers, Frenchmen mainly, who traveled cheerfully up and down the natural highways of the American interior. The many great rivers running north and south, which sustained not only life and limb, but a flourishing trade between Canada and the Gulf of Mexico in furs, skins, turpentine, tar, lead, grains, rum, and whiskey. All the traffic was down these rivers that flow into this basin the Missouri, the Illinois, the Wabash, the Ohio, all coming down into the great current of the Mississippi, down to Louisiana and the port of New Orleans. Now, we should understand that in 1803, Louisiana was not the compact state in the Deep South that we know today, and that we associate with, uh, what? With petroleum and sugar cane and sweet potato and gumbo and the origins of Dixieland jazz. Watch. Here's today's Louisiana. But in 1803, Louisiana embraced the whole watershed west of the Mississippi, comprising the present-day states of Louisiana, Arkansas, Missouri, Oklahoma, both Dakotas, uh, Nebraska, Iowa, Minnesota, Kansas, Colorado, Wyoming, Montana. Look at it. One third of a nation all the way up to Canada. Now, nobody ruled these vast lands. There were a few trading posts, a few garrisons, but only 1% of whites had settled it, and even the most sophisticated of them had only the most romantic notions of how it looked, 
and what was there. In 1801, this huge land mass was owned by Spain, but in that year she was forced to yield it to Napoleon in a secret treaty. At the same time, he had dispatched to the West Indies a French expeditionary force to suppress a native revolt, but there was more to it than that. When Thomas Jefferson heard that French ships had arrived in Santo Domingo, he was the first to suspect that this was a mere rehearsal for the subsequent planting of a French empire in Louisiana and the United States. In Santo Domingo, the flower of the French infantry had wilted, enervated by heat and malaria, baffled by natives on their own terrain, and they were led by a black general, Toussaint Louverture, a master of guerrilla warfare, which was a furtive military type, quite beyond the talent of the portrait painters of the day to represent. The upshot was that Napoleon lost 24,000 of his finest soldiers. Santo Domingo was, in fact, his Vietnam. He withdrew and decided against any other adventures 3,000 miles from home. So he sold Louisiana freehold, and the territorial transfer was signed right here in this room in the Cabildo in New Orleans. And, uh, it was all kept so secret that only 20 days elapsed between the knowledge that Louisiana had passed from Spain to France and then that the Americans had bought it. And the very day the people gathered in the square outside here to celebrate the fact that they were becoming Frenchmen, they were suddenly Americans. A confusion of what today I suppose we'd call a identity that seems to cause no pain at all. I think this bust in the Cabildo ought to be inscribed, Thomas Jefferson chuckled here. Because you see, a president can only conclude a treaty with a foreign nation with the advice and consent of the Senate. Jefferson advised and consented with nobody. He didn't mention a word of the whole Louisiana Purchase till it was finished. And his comment on why he kept it secret is a wonderfully barefaced bit of gall worthy of Franklin Roosevelt at his blandest. Listen to this. This treaty must, of course, be laid before both houses. Both, I presume, will see their duty to their country in ratifying and paying for it. The executive, I grant, has done an act beyond the Constitution. But it is the case of a guardian investing the money of his ward in purchasing an important adjacent territory and saying to him, when of age, I did this for your good. Of course, it was unconstitutional, it was outrageous. But in the end, even Jefferson's enemies accepted it for the most reliable of American reasons. It worked. Clinching the smoothest deal in the history of real estate, Jefferson had doubled the existing territory of the United States for the price of a Miami Beach hotel. Sixteen million dollars, or four cents an acre. Jefferson decided at once to measure and survey it with a military expedition led by his secretary, Meriwether Lewis, and an old soldier buddy of his, William Clark. Like stout Cortez, they picked up an Indian girl, a 16-year-old Shoshone named Sacagawea, who, with her French-Canadian husband, would be guide, interpreter, and go-between. In the one really threatening encounter with the Indians, she got between Lewis and the menacing chief, who astoundingly turned out to be her brother. Jefferson's orders were, as always, crisp and all-embracing. They were to open up a river route for a continental fur trade, to study the Indian tribes, their languages and customs, to be nice to them on all occasions, but to convey the message that they now belonged to the great white father back in Washington.
The expedition was blithely required to do for the whole unseen continent what Jefferson had done for his familiar Virginia. To list and describe all the birds, trees, plants, fish, weather systems, geology, to sketch the characteristic profile of every native they came across. This pinhead is a member of the Flathead tribe. After mapping all the interior river systems, they were to march over the single range, as Jefferson imagined, of the Rocky Mountains. As a clincher, they were to get to the headwaters of the Columbia River, claim the whole continent for the United States, and so float sweetly in triumph to the Pacific. When they saw it, after nearly two exhausting years, it was as if the first two men had landed on the moon. Lewis and Clark died young enough never to doubt the blessing they'd bestowed on their countrymen. But the Indian girl lived to be 90. She must have been an embittered old lady for the great expedition doomed the right of her people to keep their native land. The decisive blow fell a quarter century later on the peaceful tribes of the Deep South, the Chickasaws, the Choctaws, the Creeks, the Cherokees. They were forcibly dispossessed. Now, clearly, there were many, many forces and attitudes to explain why the banishment of the Indian from his own lands was inevitable. But this was one, a very powerful force, though a harmless looking thing. This is cotton, young cotton, three weeks away from full bloom. When the southern pioneers broke through the mountains and came into these flat lands and the Mississippi Delta beyond, they saw what they wanted their west to look like, an empire of cotton, not a campground for Indian tribes. So the great cotton states, Mississippi, Alabama, Georgia, they outlawed the tribal kingdoms. And in 1830, Andrew Jackson, who was then president, pushed a bill through Congress ordering that all the Indian tribes, uh, whatever farmers, hunters, whether they were hostile, peaceable, to be removed west to the west of the Mississippi. Well, they started to pad away, the Choctaws, the Creeks, the Chickasaws. There was a brave pause when the Cherokee appealed to the Supreme Court and Chief Justice Marshall ruled they were right. There was no constitutional right to remove them from their ancestral lands. President Jackson said this decision is, and I quote, too preposterous. And in one of the most shameless and possibly the most arbitrary act of an American president, he simply ignored the Supreme Court and he said to the army, get them out. And so began what is poetically and truly called the Trail of Tears. 30,000 Cherokee were persuaded, chained, gently led, viciously driven, hunted as far west as Oklahoma. And along the way, a quarter of them died. This imperious order came to apply as far west as the white man cared to explore. It was meant to confine the remaining Indians to the Siberia of the far west. But out there were tougher tribes who escaped confinement by their blessed possession of the horse. Their mobility, a heritage from the Spanish, helped them to hunt for food and go on warring among themselves. Until the day 50 years later, when the white man would subdue them all they maintained their freedom and their defiance. <laughs>
In the meantime, the Far West was still an exploitable wilderness for any white land pirate who had the stamina to knock around it. The most footloose of these freebooters roved and ambled across the plains right into the Rockies. Now why should these men come hacking and tracking 2,000 miles or more to the Rocky Mountains? Maybe they'd heard of Lewis and Clark and knew the country was up for grabs, but they were not, shall we say, idealists. They didn't say, yes sir, Mr. Jefferson, we are going to conquer the Northwest for Jeffersonian democracy. They came here for a very practical reason. They came here for an animal. The animal was the beaver, and this was his homeland. Now, why should anybody want to invade the homeland of this most intelligent and industrious and useful of animals? In those days, the rivers and streams of the Rockies abounded with beavers, the famous bridge builders, tunnel builders, home builders. Well, it was not for himself. It was what he could be made into. And this was mainly it by a whimsy of fashion the beaver hat. This was the racy headgear in New York, Boston, Philadelphia, Paris, London, Vienna, and of course it was an immense trade. Both the British and the Americans got into it. And in a curious way, a kind of microcosm of the British 18th century versus Jeffersonian democracy happened right here in this setting, 6,000 miles from Regency London and over 2,000 miles from Mr. Jefferson's study two opposing systems. The British system was a straightforward class system. At the top, management, the Englishmen and the Scots. They did the hiring and they kept the books. Below them, the canoeists, usually French Canadians. At the bottom of the heap, the Indians. They were the trappers. By the way, they shipped out from England three different grades of Indian tea to accommodate the tastes of these three classes. Now, I said the Indians, they were the people who caught the pelts. They were the people who delivered the skins to the posts, the British posts, for a dollar a throw. And the British then sold them in the international trade for ten dollars. In came the Americans. With no idea of a system or a hierarchy, they just set their own traps. And they got their own pelts. And they were delighted also to annex the Indian trade and pay the Indians three to four times what the British paid them. So the Indians deserted the British companies in large numbers. Now, they were under contract, and they could have been sued for breach, but they weren't. In the final document, it says that they were condemned, several tribes condemned, for personal disloyalty to the crown. Isn't that a marvelous echo of feudalism? The Americans didn't give a damn about loyalty or whether you corrupted an Indian with money. They were just content to pay three times the price and collar the trade, which they really did. It didn't last too long, but you may wonder where they got together to do all this bargaining and buying. As I said, there were no settlements. But in this kind of setting, there was something known as a rendezvous. In wide pastures at the foot of the mountains, the trappers gathered with their pelts, and the buyers came in with axes, kettles, and various seductive trinkets, not least whiskey, always whiskey. They might come all the way from St. Louis and all the way from British Columbia down the Pacific coast. It was, you might say, the forerunner of the American trade fair. Gradually, the rendezvous gave way to trading posts protected by stockades, in other words, forts, but the private forts of very free enterprises. In fact, much later, they were bought up for hard cash by a modest government institution known as the United States Cavalry. This one was built far away on the Pacific coast. It was the fort of a roving soldier of fortune, a debt-ridden buccaneer from Switzerland, Johann August Sutter, a self-styled Columbus with big mustachios and the bigger ambition to found and rule his own California colony. Well, he began humbly by hiring as his vice president a Scottish carpenter named Marshall. They set up business on the American River at Coloma, California, 
And what happened here changed the history of America and convinced a gloomy Karl Marx that the collapse of American capitalism would have to be postponed. They decided to go into, um, in a modest way, the, uh, the timber business together. And at the end of 1847, they built right here a sawmill. And one day, the following January, uh, James Marshall was doing one of his more tedious chores. He was inspecting and cleaning out the tail race of the sawmill, the water channel, for clogged debris and so on. And then he spotted something he'd never seen before. Small particles about the size of peas, very hard and shiny and yellow. And he later said, I sat down on the bank and began to think mighty hard. One of the simplest and most fateful sentences in American history. He took the particles to Sutter and they weighed them on apothecary scales, checked their findings in an encyclopedia, and then they made a breathtaking guess. And they swore each other to secrecy about it. But within a week, it was out. And within a year, the whole world had heard about it. And the American River became suddenly as famous as the Mississippi. <laughs>